um, and just for a um, little bit of housekeeping, everyone knows where the toilets are and in the event of an emergency, um, we go outside. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, I'd like to um, ask Gwani uh, to do the Kankia. Thank you. Kia to mai te maramatanga, kia to mai te rangi marie, kia to mai te kaha me te aroha mo tene kaupapa. Hui e taiki. Um, yep, so uh, I think because we've got people on Zoom, if you could put your hands up if you would like to speak. Don't just speak because we need to have um, only one person talking at a time and using their microphone. Thank you. Um, so are there any apologies? I have none recorded here. No. No public forum. Declarations of interest. No. Now we have the minutes of the meeting of the 22nd of August to be confirmed. And is there anybody who would like to move that? Moved. Moved by... Uh, Deputy Chair Sansom, seconder. Thank you. Oh, who's that going to be? Councillor Moore. Um, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So now we'll move on to um, reports, and uh, we have the. Um, report about the consultation and I would just say that the purpose of the meeting today is to agree that what on what is going to go out for consultation to the community that is the stage that we're at and so discussion around that so I'll leave it up to uh, who's going to present this report is this going to be you or winning <laughs> I just got <laughs> I just got the message. <laughs> Sounds like me. <laughs> um, so, councillors, as you'll recall from the last meeting, um, the joint committee was largely comfortable with the proposal on the table but wanted more detail in terms of um, community engagement with sector groups. Um, so that's really what we've been doing over the last month or two, and unfortunately it's taken a wee bit of time by the time information went out to those people and responses came back. Um, however, I'd have to say that for most of the pest species, the feedback has been very positive, um, including for the um, cat conversations. Now, I think Richard and um, Phil might wish to... Um, step into this space, but in the Tasman area, we spoke with the um, Broadwiti Community Council and they were very comfortable with um, what was proposed for the area. Department of Conservation in that area did have a slightly um, interesting take on it and they wanted the area that the rules would apply to extended um, outside the existing um, Lake Rotowiti, um site-led program area through the top house saddle area there are a pile of small settlements um, through that area which are largely rural residential lifestyle batchy um, in nature um, and they wanted to pick all of those up within the actual um, Lake Rotowiti um, site lead program which seemed like a, um, a, a pretty good suggestion really in the scheme of things. Um, so the um, the proposal got modified, um, the map got modified. In fact, it took more than that because it's slightly bigger than the original site-led program and we didn't want to mess around with the existing site-led program, thereby opening it up for a potential challenge. So it's effectively a new CAT site-led program for St Arnold. Now, Phil and Richard have also been talking with SPCA and various groups within the Nelson area, so perhaps they could uh, speak to that. 
Yeah, good morning. Um, so through this pre-consultation process, I talked to um, our local SPCA manager. Uh, I talked to um, one of our vets um, in place of the and New Zealand Vet Veterinary Association because they're not very active at, mo at the moment in Nelson, but someone who has been past member of that and understands the the vet's opinions. Um, and I also talked to uh, a couple of uh, the people who manage large stray colonies, one in Tasman and one in Nelson. Uh, and the feedback that I got from everyone was um, they're supportive and they would prefer to have um, microchipping and desexing type rules to help them about doing what they want to do, which is slightly different than the biodiversity goals that we're looking for. But that was the feedback, um, and it was unanimous across the, um, all of them. Um, yeah, good morning, councillor. Just one other thing I wanted to add to what Phil has said uh, coming out of our discussions with the SPCA was some uh, clarification around definitions, especially with regard to stray cats. So we've revised that in the proposal as well. Thanks, Richard and Phil. If I can just continue on. Um, in terms of cats, um, councillors will be aware that a bylaw process is also um, <clears throat> underway in Tasman and I believe in Nelson as well. Is that correct, Richard? Uh, we just will be providing um, options on a bylaw in April to the Nelson City Council. Thank you. So in terms of Tasman, um, there is consultation currently happening. Um, I believe it closes off today, does it? About the end of this week. <clears throat> Um, when I last looked, a couple of hundred people had responded. 90% um, of those that had responded supported um, mandatory microchipping and desexing of cats. Um, so that is very complementary to what we are discussing with the um, Regional Pest Management Plan. Obviously, a different piece of legislation, um, a slightly different process, but it, it all um, links in and supports. Um, and it probably picks up um, the test agent conversation in that um, if we manage to pass a bylaw which includes mandatory desexing and microchipping, then a lot of the test agent um, provisions that we've been discussing um, double up effectively. Um, so, so, so that's very positive. Um, I should draw councillors' attention probably to page 24 of their agendas at this point. So page 24 includes table 4, um, which actually has a list of the various parties that have been spoken to uh, during the last couple of months or had opportunity to comment on the um, draft proposal. <clears throat> probably the biggest conversation we've had has been with the forestry industry um, with the wild and conifer provisions and as you uh, no doubt fully um, uh, understand forestry is a major sector within the top of the south um, and is certainly very important to our economy uh, but also very important that it um, contributes to our environment and um, We've distributed to the major forestry companies, to Tasman Pine, to P.F. Olson's, to um, 141, um, copies of the Walden proposals. And there have been a couple of meetings and a couple of um, opportunities for them to provide some feedback. They've done so by way of documents that are in attachment five of your agenda. Um, and uh, can I point out the stage that they've, they've done that by way of a formal submission, but they weren't asked for formal submissions. Um, I'm not quite certain how we will deal with those formal submissions um, through this process. Uh, normally, once the public notification occurs um, and you have your submission period open, um, then you accept your formal submissions and they have standing in terms of 
the consideration and decision making process and standing in terms of any rights of appeal. So we'll we'll need to work through if they wish to continue with those um, for submissions, whether we accept those as part of the formal process or whether um, we ask them to resubmit them um, as part of the formal process. I, I'm sure either could be done, but I just just point that out at this stage. Um, in terms of the Wild and Conifer stuff, <clears throat> the primary author there has been Peter Russell. And Peter, can I ask you to, Peter's on the Zoom screen up there, um, to take the councillors through um, the conversations and where we've landed in terms of the proposal, please. Sure. Um, Morena, Madam Chair, can everyone hear me okay? So we can't hear you very well. We're just going to see if we can do something at this end. I'm as close as to my microphone as I can be. No, no, it was the volume at this end, Peter, oh. and it's been turned up. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, for the opportunity to talk to your um, committee. Yeah, the Wilding Conifer discussions have been interesting. Um, so it's one of the attachments to your agenda paper has summarised all the Wilding Conifer discussions um, that have been had during this process starting with the emission of wilding conifers back um, when the original plan was developed. Um, so we felt that was a good opportunity to document everything that's been discussed right through the process. So that's the first thing I'd like to say. Um, the second point would be um, the, the dialogue that we've had with the main companies, that's 141 and Tasman Pine, um, have been really constructed to date. And as Paul said, they have um, made a number of submissions. Some of them have submitted twice uh, on various points, which would really help to shape our thinking. Um, we're probably not aligned on the fact that around uh, Pinus radiata is included as a wilding conifer, but in most other regards, the the trees, the pine tree conifer groupings that we have got, um, they seem to be reasonably happy with that. Um, we have aligned uh, the policy pretty much with Mulberg District, um, but there are a couple of new rules that have been introduced which um, haven't featured at the moment in other pest management plans around the country. And I think, I mean, we probably will get into that later on, but I think um, it's a reflection of where the discussion has gone nationally on how do we treat um, other situations that are currently um, not being managed. So look, it's a it's a quite a complex subject to work through. Um, um, is it likely we'll we'll get on to welding conifers and pest conifers at a later point during the meeting? I would imagine. Thank, thank, thank you. Um, so, have you you want have you got more that we are we still on going on your? Uh, Madam Chair, Peter, uh, Peter was asking if we get on to it later in the meeting. More we'll discussion. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. Have we got any questions that people would like to ask at this point? Rituals generally. Um, I mean, about, yeah, I, yeah, so I sent yeah. through some questions. I might as yeah. well ask them yeah. if that's good. I won't that's ask cool. all of them, but um, I thought some of them were just good to maybe ask and have answered in public. So um, I, I was just wondering when is the next review of this, of the um, regional peace management plan likely, just so that we know, you know, how long this is for. So. So, Councillor, the, the current pest management plan is 2019 to 2029. So the normal course of events would be we'd um, start a review process maybe a year before the end of the pest management plan, maybe in 2028. Thanks. And then um, I kind of turn my mind to 
how would we deal with other um, maybe kind of uh, pest or biodiversity incursions such as cal calurpa seaweed, which I think is raising concern in the North Island at the moment. I'm just wondering, you know, if that becomes an issue here, do we then do another review to um, update this? I've just, so, sorry. Just, just very quickly, I think it would be quite helpful to just have a very quick rundown um, on how how pests get elevated to the point where we start to think about putting them into the legislation and into the pest management plan because you know there's hundreds out there. <laughs> There, there are probably two formal mechanisms under the biosecurity legislation that one could look at. One is a limited review, uh, such as we're doing at the moment, which takes you through a very similar process to a full review, but you've just narrowed it to a, a small number of pests, which in the case of the current review, were considered by the two full councils uh, who approved the terms of reference for this regional pest management joint committee um, and agreed that those potential pest species should be run through a pest management process. The other way, which in terms of a marine invasive organism that rocks up, um, when Sabella appeared in the top of the south, um, the Top of the South Councils used a provision of the Biosecurity Act called a small-scale management plan. Now, a small-scale management plan doesn't run through the full process. It is by declaration of the councils. They can declare a plan. Um, it's limited in duration to no more than three years. It's limited in terms of the amount of money you can spend and I can't remember off the top of my head, it's something like $300,000. So Peter probably recalls the precise number. Um, but the councils here at the top of the south for Sabella initially went, we'll declare small-scale management plans and we'll hook into it. Um, and then that got rolled into the last review of the regional pest management plan. So um, it's something you do as a temporary measure when you've got uh, invasive pest species that um, is... Knocking at your door. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I've just got a couple more questions. Um, and one is around um, cats in relation to Nelson and one for Tasman. So um, just for the officers. Um, so I was just on a page of the agenda, page 45, where it talks about the pest agent um, rule for St. Arnold. I just wondered whether there'd been any consideration of something like that around the Brookwine Marama Sanctuary area in Nelson. Um, yeah, so I was thinking the Brook, York, Might I, that kind of halo, but... Um, do you want to read our written answer and we can go from there? Um, yes, yeah, so we had sort of provided a response in, in relation to the Samarid provisions and, and Nelson. So um, for the Samarid site, there's a lot, it's a lot more realistic for a pest agent type rule. Um, Just pull your microphone a wee bit closer. Yeah, apologies. So for, for Samarid, it's a much more realistic situation there to, ha to have a pest agent type rule. Um, because unlike, unlike in Nelson, it's not to confounded by a large urban population with a lot of higher cat numbers um, to control as in companion cats. Um, and just noting that the pest agent rule proposed for Sonata is, is picking up or based on the provisions that Southland Regional Council have for Rakiro or Stewart Island, where um, any cats going to Stewart Island need to be um, microchip. Um, Whereas in Nelson, um, the rules that we're proposing relate to council land only, except for some of the around the uh, lighthouse, Port Nelson, and public conservation dock land, 
um, on the boulder bank. So, um, and the proposed Nelson specific rule is that no pe no person shall deliberately release into the wild uh, any named high value site in Nelson, as shown on the maps, any companion or stray cat. Um, so that's particularly focusing on, uh, I guess, dumping of cats and increasing the stray cat problem there. Um, and also, in addition to that, there's snip and chip bylaw that um, we're hoping to introduce along with public education, as point indicated, would really support um, rules both in Tasman and Nelson. So I'm not, I'm not sure if that clarifies no, the situation really for you around the pest agent. Yeah, no, it does. It was really helpful. Rule. And then I think, my, um, I, I guess because we're in the consultation document we got, that was the first time we saw the maps of the actual yes. areas that were going to be proposed. So okay. I was just curious about why, um, yeah, there was a pest agent rule for some areas but not others, and that was really great explanation. And then I was just curious for Golden Bay um, if there had been any consideration for places like Puponga. I'm aware of the um, One Tahua uh, pest free on Itahua initiative, I think, which is farewell split. Um, and there is a settlement at Puponga um, at the base of the split. So I was just wondering if there'd been any consideration of having the pest agent role for any other areas like there or um, the, I think the other place was the Motueka, um, Motueka Sand Spit or Rotatai Reserve, just thinking of or any of the other um, yeah, nationally or internationally important shorebird nesting sites. Just aware that there's a lot more areas of kind of biodiversity significance than just the one in the... Do you want to speak to that? Would you like to speak to that one? <laughs> uh, yep, I can. I guess there's uh, probably two prongs for that for Tasman currently. So one, we're using the um, pest management plan in Tasman primarily to support existing work. So we know we have um, DOC operating in Able Tasman and um, community groups in Rotuiti, and that's helping them deliver that work. If we had community groups come through who did want to operate in that same way in those locations that you've suggested, then we could consider them as a site. Um, but we don't currently, and... I think the, so Puponga specifically is um, public conservation land. And so DOC didn't raise that when we talked to them. They didn't, didn't raise that as a request. So they could um, potentially, if we, as we go through the process, but um, they probably think they, yeah, yeah, they might. Um, and the bylaw process, which is not around biodiversity and biosecurity, but is introducing some potential rules around um, desexing and microchipping and registration, um, is sort of aiming for that Tasman-wide um, friendlier approach rather than having um, very sort of these patchy spots, you know, everywhere where there's different rules for one community and then straight down the road has a, has a different set of rules, which may not be necessarily fair. Surrounding the national parks makes sense to us. Okay, that's really helpful. So I I, I think then um, the only last question really is that as, this, uh, as we go out to public consultation, um, if there are any community conservation groups maybe that are working in particular areas as we have with Waimea Inlet and they request that it be included, um, you know, that a pest agent rule be included for that particular area, is that something that we can consider through the submissions for possible inclusion? Yeah, if I, if I could respond to that, please, <clears throat> and I'd draw a parallel when um, the last review of the regional pest management plan occurred <clears throat> and through submissions we were asked to include Abel Tasman National Park, the private land enclaves within the park. The councillors of the day were sympathetic to that and wanted that to happen. However, um, there are some natural justice issues in that the uh, people who owned that land in the park had no idea 
that um, the, a proposal was on the table to um, include them within a site-led program. So we wound up going through a, an additional round of consultation, uh, basically sent out the information to all of those landowners so that they had the opportunity to consider it and to respond um, and to give them rights should they decide to appeal. So uh, yes, it can be done, um, but we need to look out for those natural justice issues as we go. And if we were to introduce a new um, site-led program on the fly, so to speak, um, we would need to go to those people and make sure they had opportunity to engage in the process. Okay, thanks. I've got no further questions. And, we're, and just signaling I'm happy to move the recommendations whenever, but okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, this has been moved. Um, is anybody like to, oh, Councillor Kinloff? Thank you. Can I talk about it before? Okay. Um, I'm going to put it out there. Um, I'm not happy with what we're promoting in the Regional Pest Management Plan. And I'd like to see, instead of a site-specific one, that we have a regional regional plan that says that cats are de um, I think the what we're doing is sending set, uh, mixed messages. If we're going to go down a bylaw that says there's going to be cats are going to be uh, de-sexed and microchipped, then we've got to send a signal through this plan that we support that area there. So by going separately and saying, but we're only going to do this bit over here, but forget about the rest of it, I think we're sending six mixed messages. So I'd like to see the group around the table here argue why it should not be a blanket de-sexing across our districts. Um, so I'll put it out there. Yep, yep, I, I did start the response, Councillor. Um, I think we need to look back at <coughs> the pieces of legislation we're operating under. <coughs> Our regional Pest Management Plan deals with, obviously, pest animals. Um, it doesn't deal with domestic cats. It doesn't deal with community cats. Um, it deals with animals that are declared to be a pest under that piece of legislation. <coughs> Whereas the bylaw approach is under the Local Government Act generally, and the bylaw allows you to make um, bylaws that relate to um, health, welfare, um, amenity. <clears throat> um, so that, and it allows you to uh, make bylaws that relate to the management of animals. Um, so you can use the bylaw approach to do something like de-sexing and microchipping of domestic cats. If you were trying to use the Biosecurity Act to do that, you could really only do it through a pest agent rule saying, well, you know, any cat that's not microchipped and not de-sexed is a pest agent that could lead to being more cats. It's, it's a bit tenuous, to be honest, and the advice that the staff are giving is that um, it's better to uh, combine the two approaches in, in order to achieve the outcome. Use the Local Government Act legislation in terms of domestic, use the Biosecurity Act legislation in terms of the ferals. Uh, but uh, can I throw it open to my colleagues here for <laughs> their response? Um, yes, I agree with you, Paul. I just wonder whether, Peter, you might um, have a comment on this because he's he's researched it fairly thoroughly for uh, for both councils. So. Yes, sure. Um, look, I think Paul's really hit the nail on the head in terms of biosecurity legislation. You, um, if you went down that track of de having de sexed and microchip cats, they would essentially all cats would be declared pests. Um, under that approach through a pest management plan. And I don't think that would be the intention of the councils to have um, companion cats labelled as pests. Um, and I think that at the moment we are, ham not hamstrung, but we're, there's two separate pieces of legislation, as Paul said, through the Local Government Act or through the Biosecurity Act. It really is appropriate 
only to be able to address um, the feral cat issue under the current legislation. Thank you. Or we're going to Stu or Matt. I, I have more to say, but I want want the table to have yep. their right, say before it. I carry on. Thank you. <laughs> I'm with my colleague here. Um, I think we either do something about cats or we don't. But it's, it's, there's no point in pretending what's happening. And it's all very well to say, to single out national parks and places like that. But um, I'll give you an example. I own the section next door to me. I let it go fallow to my wife's horror. And it, it grew and flowered. Um, butterflies turned up from everywhere, magpie moths, which I hadn't seen for years, and skinks. And then all the neighbourhood cats turned up, no skinks. Gone. So, you know, cats are a major problem. Um, the Brook Y Mar Marama Sanctuary has said that they've suddenly found an unusual number of cats around their perimeter. Well, I, I don't think that should be a surprise. We've made a predator-free area where they can breed, chicks can be hatched, go down to the ground, feed. This is life. This is easy. Sit on the fence. It's quite a bit of food over there. Bang. We're just feeding the cats. Brook Sanctuary <clears throat> is breeding birds to feed cats. Um, I think it has to be blanket. And I, I take the point that you make about the different laws, but that shouldn't be an excuse not to do it. If, if it's the right thing. If it's the right thing to do, then surely the minds around this table can work out a way to do it. Um, that should not be a reason not to do it just because it's difficult or complicated. Thank you. Aaron? Um, thank you. Um, I, I applaud the intent of my fellow councillors who want us to effectively address this problem of the effect of cats on biodiversity. Um, we, in previous discussions quite early on, we did discuss this, and we I think where we came to was that to be most effective, we would have appropriate measures under this pest management plan to the extent that we can, and each council would have a bylaw, and those three things together would address what you're saying. It would be both site-specific and regional-wide, and we would address you know, urban cats and, and so on, and we, and we would be most effective. So I guess my question of officers, is that still our position that with those three measures, we are eff effectively achieving what the other councillors have been asked that we, um, what we do? I'll, I'll start, if I may, please. In the ideal world, we would have a cat law in this country, just as we have dog laws. And that cat law <clears throat> would include all of the provisions in terms of um, management of cats, would give officers powers to um, seize the domestic cat and... Um, make sure that the provisions of the Act are um, suitably um, <clears throat> uh, adhered to. However, central government um, has not chosen at this stage to introduce cat legislation, which leaves local and regional government um, trying to do the best they can with the legislation that we currently have available, whilst continuing to advocate to central government the need for national legislation. So, in short, the answer is yes, in my view, that a combination of the Local Government Act and the Regional Pest Management Plan is our best way moving forward in a way that is legally robust. Um, it's not ideal. We need national legislation, but we don't have it.
Thank you, Madam Chair, for you. Um, so just a couple of things, firstly, around the cats. So I'm just a little concerned that we might be using a sledgehammer here to crack a walnut. Um, and I, the question that Paul's just responded to is really what I wanted to flesh out a bit. So the combination is effectively the best combina uh, outcome, really, is it the uh, feral cats in uh, site lead areas and the proposed bylaw that we have, particularly for us here in Tasman. Anyway, and that way we, because I, I just see a real issue with feral cats and the whole district being part of the um, regional pest management plan, because I'm not sure how would it ever enact that. It'd be a real challenge and cost. And um, for a bylaw, in my way of thinking, it's a much better option. And also we can phase it in over time, but particularly things around like the microchipping, d because we can't expect the community to have the microchip every cat straight off. There's got to have to be some lead in time, starting with young kittens and older cats and things like that. But I do have a question around the uh, additions to uh, the late Rotorete site lead. We can do that as part of this process, but we can't go to the whole area because it just becomes too challenging, too huge, what I've just alluded to. I, I, I'm going to largely duck this, Councillor. Um, <laughs> It comes down to practicality and having um, a, a motivated group who are prepared to largely um, carry forward the um, the provisions of the site-led program. Um, unless the council wants to employ additional staff to chase cats around Tasman District, and then face the issue of trying to figure out which was a domestic cat and which one was a feral cat. It's probably better that it be done on in areas of particularly high biodiversity value, um, which is why um, our proposal in Tasman has been for the um, the Able Tasman and the Nelson Lakes National Park area, where there is active control occurring. And by introducing this change to the pest management plan, the council supporting action in those areas. Um, technically, you could have a district wide um, provision, but um, it's a big but in terms of um, how practical it would be or how affordable it would be. Winnie? Yeah, you can't talk the words out of my mouth there, Paul. But um, the yeah, the the difference is the cost, really. Um, the bylaw one, uh, we do have some provisional data for the bylaw pre, you know, early consultation. Really supportive for. Um, so we've had about fifteen hundred responses, and yeah, eighty seven percent are supportive of microchipping and even higher for desexing. So. Yeah, it's worth keeping that in mind for Tasman. That that's that's a process that is uh, is much easier for us to work through and have as a bylaw that we can manage in a, a reasonably controllable resource uh, versus bringing it bringing a district wide rule through the regional pest management plan. We'd have to resource that, uh, so then we would be asking for um, a lot more staff really to be able to enforce it because if it's in the plan, we have to enforce it. Um, so that's a yeah. For me, it's just I just see dollars that I'm not willing to, you know, necessarily ask for of the community just yet. <laughs> if I could, sorry, just add, add to that that also there's a, a real practicality issue. If, for example, you promulgated a rule in a pest management plan that the landowner is responsible for controlling feral cats on their land, um, feral cats are very mobile. Um, and it's rather unfair on those landowners to have to uh, constantly be dealing with the flux of cats passing through their properties. Phil? Yeah, I, was, I suppose I'm bringing it back to the two different mechanisms, and, and I see especially in, in Nelson, if we were to, to force a rule on many people, it might um, 
it might bring back quite a negative response and, and, and stop us from engaging with people to make a change. So I, I see the bylaw approach that, that affects our, our residents uh, will, will allow us to engage with them and, and slowly bring in rules which are going to help us for biodiversity and for welfare issues with, with cats. Uh, so, so it would be very difficult for us as a council to police uh, through the Biosecurity Act every cat in Nelson. It'd be... I mean, I don't know how many officers we don't have already, and we just will need a lot more. <laughs> Can I reply? Um, thank you, everybody, for your input. I'm a bit battered now, so I'll move back a bit. Um, I still think we're sending mixed messages with the regional mess pest management plan saying we can do this area here and this one here because I think it's high biodiversity and we're going to get it cheap labour because the community's going to do it. But what about the areas that are outside of that, that feral cats go to, that the biodiversity we don't care a shit about, sorry, we don't care about because we can't deal with. I think we've got one eye closed and one eye open. I think sometimes you need to get in hard to say to people it's not right just to let your cat go into forest and she'll be right. So I'm suggesting around the table now that it's still not right. And I know my colleague here on the right will be putting daggers into me very soon. That I think... We've got to grow some strength in this regional pest management plan and send a signal to everybody who doesn't care about their cat. If Christmas is here, we'll give the child a cat, and then six months later, it's off into the woods. We've got to send a positive signal. And yes, I know we can do it through the bylaw. And looking at what I've received, that 98% um, of the respondents have their cats deceased. I think we're just following along from what the community wants. So unless the Biosecurity Act says you cannot do this, but you can do this with feral cats and nominate what a feral cat is, I think we should get stronger and be bold and say no to feral cats being left. Because at the end of the day, a feral cat is not the cat's problem, it's feral. It's our, it's our problem around here that made it that way. And that's because we haven't, in my mind, given the laws or the restrictions to people to say, it's not right to dump your cat in a forest. So if it's got a microchip and a D6, we know that it's not a feral cat. Someone's loved it. Otherwise, it's not a loved cat, not a companion cat. So, um, so that's me at the moment. But when we go and take a vote around the table, I'll do that. Um, I've also been given some information from the TDC um, survey that I'd like to share with you, but I don't know how to do it. I only just looked at it about 10 minutes ago, so I presume, can I give it to the chair who would send it around the, the committee? Is it, and what form is it in? It was an email from, bear with me, um, Rob. Rob Smith, <laughs> so am I allowed to share that around, Rob? Can we put that up on the screen? Can you email it? You email it. Right. Yep, to Elaine. Yep. Thank you. And the other thing was on page twenty-four, um, Forest and Bird had not been contacted. Is that an oversight? Or is that just um, we've been too busy and we haven't got around to them? Um, well, we've had some early engagement with Forest and Bird. Uh, sorry, page 26. Um, just above cause 3.3. Is there any reason why we hadn't contacted Forest and Bird? Well, this was a process of early engagement and Forest and where um, the message, you know, went out to who wants to be involved in early engagement. 
and for some early engagement feedback has come back from Forest and Bird, well, from the Golden Bay branch anyway. Um, so in terms of the process of early engagement as to how you actually contact and who you contact for early engagement, are you able to enlighten us all? Um, the Biosecurity Act um, says that you must um, consult with the community. And at the end of the day, before you can make a pest management plan or alter it, the council will need to resolve that it did so appropriately. But it doesn't say how or who. Um, so what has become fairly established practice in the biosecurity community is that the, the, the major groups would normally be contacted early on and then it would be publicly notified and everybody would get their say. Um, now, um, yes, more effort could have been put into um, submissions by Forest and Bird or asking for submission, but it is somewhat early in a process and really the call was made that that was probably dealt with better through the formal submission process. Yeah, we can always go further and further and further, but you're doubling up on your next process. <laughs> so, um, so that is something that can be sorted out outside the meeting as to what who is on that list and probably needs some attention. Would that be who who raised the issue about Forest and Bird not being contacted? Yeah, that that needs you know these address lists um, are dynamic things. And I agree that Forest and Bird should have been on there and we can sort that out outside this. Okay, so... But having said that, Forest and Bird are aware. Okay. So to me then, I, I can keep on putting it out there, we're looking at targeted areas, but the Biosecurity Act says you can't do a region-wide one, but you can do this and you can do that. Um, is that have I got that right or wrong? Because if I've got it wrong, why can't we look at the whole region then and dictate or identify what a feral cat is as opposed to a cat? Did we ask Peter? Sure. Question from you? Yes, Right. Um, yeah, Peter, have you, are you able to make Give us some guidance on this. Yeah, um, look, it is it is um, a pretty fraught sort of discussion, really. In, in some ways, the the rule you have to have uh, certain criteria to to meet, and there's a process to go through around cost benefit analysis uh, in a national policy direction. So that's one of the first things that have to be considered. Um, I come back to Paul's point, though. A rule has to you know, it has to be realistic and has to be enforceable. And for something like um, feral cats that are hugely mobile, I don't, you, I don't know any council in the country that would be willing to take enforcement action um, around feral cat because they're just so highly mobile. I mean, whose cats are they? Um, when you look at the process that you go down, um, I'm sure um, any any lawyer would be able to drive a, a huge wedge through a rule that has uh, occupy a responsibility for cats. So that's why it's, it comes back to um, what your reason for doing the rule or, or approach would be, what's your key driver, and then what rules are in place. So for a place like Stewart Island with the pest agent rule, that's quite a, you know, they know what their purpose is. Um, they want to stop. Um, cats proliferating there, so that's why the pest agent rule is appropriate. Um, you know, no other council is considering a region-wide rule for feral cats. It's just unenforceable. And as Paul said, that until there's national cat legislation available, um, councils are kind of in that position of, of using what they've got um, available through the legislation currently. Doesn't really answer the question, but that's. 
it comes back to the is that rule enforceable? And I believe it wouldn't be. Okay, not, thank not, you. not on a region wide scale, at least. Anyway. Thank you. So, Councillor Sanson. Thanks. Um, I've just got a couple of um, follow up questions, I think three. Um, my first one's probably for you, Peter. Just in terms of um, Rakiura, Stewart Island, it's, it's you know, 1,750 kilometres squared, so it's like three times the size of Nelson. Um, how is it, how is a pest agent rule enforceable on Stewart Island, if not in another region? Like what makes it, I know it's an island, but it's still a large island. It's still a large area. How does it become enforceable there? Well, um, that's a good question. I, I believe um, so. Cats are a bit of becoming a bit of an issue on on Rakiura, um, and they want to be able to stop the spread of cats and companion animals breeding with uh, any ferals that are in the area. So the the driver was to put um, a, a hold on companion animals can live out their natural life. But any new animals that came onto the island, I don't think they're proposing to stop in that, but they'd have to be de sexed and uh, microchipped and registered um, and all, all that, and you know, live in that. Um, it's basically the urban area around Oban, which they're concerned with. Um, so it becomes imminently more doable to have a rule on that basis, and it, it makes it easier, obviously, being an island, um, not having that the to and fro that would happen um, on the mainland. That's okay. how I understand it is. I'm, I'm not 100% um, sure, but that's, that's my understanding of, of where they're coming from. Okay, and then um, follow-up question, which sorry, is probably sorry, just um, James. James, do you have a comment on this? It was the same comment that Peter has just made on the size of the urban population on Rakiura versus the whole island. You've got 500 people, 500 families live there in one place, more or less. Um, and an island where there's feral cats everywhere. So the department's got the ability to do the feral cat control and the RPMP has been used to do the urban cat management. Um, and, Thank you. And then um, just in terms of feral cat control on private land, if if you have the, um, I guess we have the, the um, strategy, the plan that we're going to you know, put out for consultation, um, I guess with something like a pest agent rule, does that actually allow private landowners to trap feral cats? So, is, I mean, at the moment, does it matter? Can anybody trap feral cats on their land or cats on their land? So, if you're if you're a private landowner, are you legally allowed to trap a cat that comes onto your land? And I'm wondering if that's the difference. You know, like um, if 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 we can't currently if you know, if a farmer isn't currently allowed to trap a cat that's on its land, what is the mechanism to allow it, if not the pest agent rule? Let's go to answer that. I've got an opinion on it. <laughs> that's a great question. Could you just pull your microphone a bit closer? Thank you. And the reason I have an opinion on it is because I have two hectares of peri-urban land. Um, you are legally allowed to trap feral cats on your own land. What you're not allowed to do is destroy a cat that it belongs to someone. It's destruction of property. And so you need to be able, before yeah. you destroy that cat, you need to be able to know whether what you've got is just a cat or someone's property. That's why the microchip and desexing was such an important um, component to the St. Arnold program is for the department to be able to tell those feral cats versus the versus the own cats apart to be able to uh, get that rule to work the way that's going to work. Um, when we looked at the same approach across the peri-urban area for the rest of Nelson and Tasman, and we have considered these issues quite deeply, um, we found that the rule didn't work as effectively because of the greater number of people that would be involved uh, the discussion we had with the SBCA, I remember them being quite distraught with us calling pest agent cats, pest agent cats, for the very reason of the image that that conjures. 
um, but in their mind it was acceptable for that to be a, in the St. Arnold program because it's an established program. You've got a community there that, by and large, understand really what's going on. Uh, the same can't be said for the rest of the region. So coming back to your question, yes, you can destroy a cat on your land, but um, you're going to be liable for any costs that will occur back on you if it happens to then be someone else's pet. Thanks. And then my just final question is, um, so we're, we're hearing really clearly officer advice that the best approach is to um, um, pursue um, cat management and feral cat management through the regional pest management strategy as laid out in the consultation um, document um, alongside a cat bylaw which includes desexing and microchipping. However, is there not a risk that we're not going to achieve that outcome if TDC does not adopt a bylaw that includes desexing? Because my understanding is that TDC is actually quite, you know, is considering only doing microchipping, which would seem to me to kind of undermine the um, benefit of even what we're planning to do here. Whereas Nelson is giving really, Nelson Governance Table is giving really strong and clear advice to their officers around wanting to see desexing and microchipping um, in the bylaw that goes out for consultation. So I'm just wondering, you know, is there any way to ensure that we aren't undermining this process by ensuring that TDC does go out for a bylaw that includes desexing as well as microchipping? Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul, uh, with the history. Th thank you, Councillor. Um, I probably don't have the history um, of Pat, but I, I would say Tasman has an open mind uh, in terms of whether it's just microchipping or microchipping and desexing. Uh, we've watched what's happened in the rest of the country and where other councils have landed. And probably one of the main councils we've taken note of has been the, the Wellington Council, uh, which started off with um, a bylaw that required uh, microchipping, desexing, and a limit on cat numbers. Through quite a protracted process, um, they managed to get through the microchipping initially, um, but the desexing and the limit on cat numbers fell away at that time. Um, microchipping is step number one. As James said a minute ago, um, you need to be able to separate a feral cat from a domestic cat. Microchip's your gold standard. Um, your microchip says this cat is actually an owned cat and it's owned by this person. Um, no microchip, arguably not an owned cat. You've got a reasonable basis to say this is a feral cat if it presents as a feral cat. Um, I think as officers, we would totally support desexing because you know we are trying to pull back cat numbers and what we see really badly in the Tasman area is kitten dumping. Um, and it's affecting our rural landowners very badly, and Councillor Bryan may speak to this in a moment, I suspect. Um, but um, if we can actually get through desexing and help um, reduce the, the breeding um, potential of domestic cats and kitten dumping, then uh, I'm sure the Tasman councillors will be supportive but it's a process and it's an open mind at this stage. I'd just like to add that I, with my last um, talking with Wellington City Council that um, desexing was back on the table. And I don't know how far through they are with that, um, but it was while well, they were talking about it. Which, Thanks, Phil. I forgot yeah. to mention that, that um, they got through the microchipping. They've now come back to try to get the rest. So that would, yeah, would indicate that there it, it is a stepped process, and um, you know if we think back to um, Tasman District Council actually voting down 
um, sending a cat by, proposed bylaw out for consultation. And now we're at the stage where Count Tasman District Council is supporting a bylaw, the actual contents of it um, are still uh, being debated. So, it, 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 and we've got this, um, we've got this plan which is under a very specific bit of legislation whereby cats would be declared pests. Um, so, uh, I think we have to see it as a stepped process. It's, it's not something that we can do all at once. Yeah, that, um, through you, Madam Chair, the, the points have largely been covered by the, uh, the speakers. Uh, all I'd add is that it's the same information which is going th through this committee and also to both councils for the councils to ultimately make a decision. And um, officers are in agreement. And I guess it's up to the advocacy that goes from this committee through to uh, our individual councils, in this case, Tasman. Um, I'd also add to that and say that some of the feedback that we're getting through the consultation exercise might lend some weight to that when it next comes before. Tasman District Council, uh, the desexing is, is perhaps something that our community is, is interested in seeing us take forward as well. Yeah, thank you for that. We'll put the motion shortly. Have I got a seconder? Yes, no. Your councillor, um, Bryant, will second. Thanks. So this is a comment rather than a question, probably. That um, I, I absolutely hear the, um, you know, the nuance and the need to kind of be really mindful of um, the impact on owners. I think also that we are, you know, we the world has moved on quite a lot, and I think that some of the um, information that's kind of gone out into the public realm um, around the impact of cats, feral cats, on our um, native um, fauna, I think, has probably helped to shift that along, as well as SPCA and the vets and that kind of thing, also all being now in alignment. So I think it's just, you know, even I think the world can move a lot in just a few years. And I'm, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, we wouldn't have the same kind of pushback either to this or to the bylaw that we might have had a few years ago. Anyway, th I just also want to thank the officers for their work on all of this. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Bryant. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, yeah, Paul just alluded to, the, and, and there's an issue in rural areas, particularly around identifying feral cats and domestic cats, because we've actually had feral cats as pet cats. And some of them have started as dumb kittens. So, is a dumb kitten a feral cat or a domestic cat that's dumb? It's a bit of a challenging area. In fact, second generation feral cats can make really good pets. And we've had some of them, and they have real character and are really good at hunting mice and rats and other things you have on rural properties. And just for example, our property at Tapua has got a mile long frontage and a bank down the other side of the road so you can achieve and we know that and have got kittens that people have dumped there and we that's really a worse thing than feral cats people dumping kittens in my mind it's a just an animal welfare thing as much as anything so it's a real problem so i think the way we're going is um satisfactory for now and I'm reasonably confident in response to council seats and that Tasman District Council will do the right thing when we get to cats <laughs> this time. But of course there's no guarantees of life. <laughs> um but I do want to ask you Madam Chair, I did have some questions for Peter about um other than cats. Could I ask them now or are you under time restraints? No, no, we um if it's if it is relevant to our yes, it's around the wilding pines and conifers. Yes, yes, yeah. So, Peter, I just wondered if I could ask you around uh, wilding pines and pine radiosata, the timber companies are they comfortable where we've got to distinguishing between plantation forests and wilding pines and wilding Douglas? Yeah, good question, Councillor. Um, I think they're still fundamentally unhappy with inclusion of radiata um, as a pest species, simply because they don't believe 
um, it spreads, and it, it certainly doesn't spread as much as something like Douglas fir. Um, they seem to be really uh, reasonably comfortable with having Douglas fir listed as a wilding uh, as a wilding conifer. Um, the the definitions, I mean, it, yeah, it is quite a complex um, issue to get the your head around from a rural point of view if you're a plantation forest owner. Um, simply the definition of what a wilding conifer is doesn't include plantation forests, um, anything over one hectare in size. So once that was um, pointed out to them that you know they wouldn't have to clear their plantation forest, that was kind of one of their initial um, points and that was clarified with Tasman Pine. They were a bit more happy to, to accept. Um, well, I think fundamentally it came back to radiata as the, the prime uh, pine species has great economic benefit. Um, but from a, I guess, looking back, standing back and looking at the issue, you know, wilding pines certainly are prone to spread in certain circumstances, and there's some recent papers around that. Um, they cannot deny um, it has a propensity to spread, um, but a lot less than other pine species, admittedly. Um, the other point was all other councils that have wild and conifers in their plans that I've seen list um, wild and conifer, uh, radiata as a wild and conifer. Marlborough District and yourselves are looking at splitting out that um, the grouping to recognise that the worst of the wild and conifers are pest conifers, and that um, those two species that have a commercial worth are listed simply as uh, wilding conifers. So there is quite a distinction between what is a pest and what is a, a species that is prone to wilding but still has some commercial value. So we've come a long way on that in that regard. Um, but yeah, they had a fundamental disagreement that radiata should be included, but that would be at odds with the rest of the country. Um, yeah, that's, I'm sure there's a lot more to be said on that, but that's kind of the study. Yeah, so just a further question of a may for you, Madam Chair, just in relation to uh, on farms where farms tend to have small uh, woodlots or a small corner in Douglas or Pine or existing shelter belts of, of the species we're talking about, how would they be affected? Um, so anything under one hectare uh, would, is not deemed to be a plantation uh, forest. So uh, that could affect some farm forestry situations and um, potentially the, the pest agent rule would come into play uh, for that circumstance if, if it was proven there were issues with spread from a, like a shelter belt of Douglas fir and someone made a complaint about it, that would be a valid uh, reason to do to enact the rule. Um, again, there's some quite high bars set with, in relation to when the rules will be activated, but um, for the small plantations of under a hectare, um, they could be uh, hoozled up in that pest agent rule. Um, it really depends where where the rules um, really fit in at the moment are in relation to the existing operation where is through the national program and through other programs that are run regionally. Um, in most cases, um, I don't believe, you know, those plantations on private property are probably greater than one hectare, I would imagine. Right, and I'm just wondering about the um, Farm Forestry Association, which I understand is quite strong locally. Were they consulted or engaged with or likely to be? I'd have to pass it over to staff. Right. Thank you. Paul? Uh, not specifically, no. Um, we use Pierre Folsons as a bit of a sounding board who manage a lot of the sort of private forest estate uh, Pierre Folsom's largely supported <clears throat> one for one and Tasman Pine in terms of their submissions. Uh, but no, we didn't go to the Farm Forestry Association <clears throat> and imagine that would be part of you know, the formal um, notification and submission process. And then I just have a few. Uh, 
Um, could I just uh, start? Just the um, there was an email that you were sending. Was that to Elaine to put up on here? Was what was that in relation to? Was that in relation to cats? Was it? Was it okay? Well, maybe you could put that up, but in in the meantime, um, I'll talk about pampas. So. Can we have a bit of an explanation? Is that the ordinary pampas or just purple pampas? And how likely is it that we're going to be able to enforce that? Uh, if I could start, um, Councillor Bright will be aware that pampas, purple pampas, um, jabata, uh, was in the uh, previous regional pest management plan. The decision was made not to continue with it as a declared pest species in the Tasman Nelson area because basically we lost the fight. Um, however, there are a few areas that still are pretty clear of purple pampas. Um, and the proposal is, well, maybe we should try and defend clear space. The proposal, and correct me if I'm wrong, team, um, is that it be both purple and common white pampas. Given the difficulty in actually separating the two for the layperson, um, it seemed to be a confusion in our previous pest management plan. People had argued the toss. Um, yes, purple pampas is far more prone to spread. That's it, by far the worst. But neither of them are flash. No, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. So I just wonder, it's because of these uh, areas that are free that you really want to keep it in there and try and keep it out rather than... That, that's because right. That would just about be as many pampas as cats. <laughs> and certainly if... If you go for a drive up through the North Island, and James and Gwynny and I were discussing this um, just before the meeting started, there are parts of the North Island where the pampas has just taken over. It's just, it's really depressing um, to see that. And if well, we've still got some areas that that hasn't happened, and we could at least attempt to try and slow the spread. Maybe one day we'll get a biocontrol agent. Maybe. Maybe. Hope so. Um, thank you. Um, so um, I've got Mike first and then Matt. You had your hand up for a wee while. Well, I was just thinking of wrapping up this feral cat thing, but that's my perspective. Do you want to talk first? Well, we, the question was raised about... The question was raised about pines which just raised another question for me. So we, we're sort of getting off target. All right. Well, look, let's, is this email you wanted the committee to see, Mike, is this to do with cats? Yes. Yeah. Do you want we're to just... Cats, like a, um, probably the middle one. It's just a summary. And... Um, Maybe Rob has here the provided information. Maybe Rob wants to talk about it. No? No. Uh, kia ora, through the chair. So this is just a summary of information that's come from the Shape Tasman website. So at the moment, the bylaw is still open for public submissions. It closes next week. Um, and so we would just asked for a quick summary of the feedback so far. So there was um, some set questions and some free text. And then from the free text, they've just done a uh, essentially a word match. So what, what's the common theme? Uh, as you've already heard this morning, there's very strong support for both D16 and for um, microchipping. And it appears that most uh, cat owners are responsible cat owners already, which is lovely. Thank you. And so, um, as Steve has said, this information will inform Tasman District Council's final consultation document. Yes, thank you. 
someone else yeah so I'd just like to highlight that um, SPCA have statistics on the same sort of thing, which is extrapolated. Um, and I would have to look at those numbers, but they'd be much um, lower than the ones that are represented on your survey. So you may have only picked up the cat owners um, in the survey. Thank you. Um, I'd like to actually put the motion. Um, I've got something more to say. Um, kia ora, through, through um, you, Madam Chair, just finally um, picking up on what Paul said about national legislation, I think it's worth both councils bearing in mind or keeping an eye on what's happening at a national level because the, before the election, the Environment Select Committee um, heard, and made, heard submissions on it and called for uh, national legislation. Um, so yeah, it'll be just interesting to see if, how how that progresses through the through new new government. I imagine it's not high on their priority, but um, certainly something for councils to support and promote at a national level. Um, well, a comment on that is that when Tasman District Council um, didn't agree to progressing our first attempt at a cat bylaw, one of the reasons was that there was anticipation that the government was actually going to make some legislation, which hasn't eventuated. Um, so just that's just quite an interesting thing, and it just reinforces what I say, that this is actually a stepped process. One more. One more, one more. Just okay, thank point, you. Yeah. Um, I've got three little comments before I'll just the white flag up. Wellington is only one reason, region or one council that is looking at this same issue. There's others around New Zealand who are more sort of symptomatic layout of the region that, that we're looking after. I think Wellington is a smaller region, higher population, less land mass than what we've got. So that's the first thing. Second thing, I'd hate to see dollars get in the way of wildlife. What I mean by that is that there's cats out there now, while we've been debating this, been killing wildlife, and yet we're saying but it's going to cost a little more staff time and dollars to do it. Tough. That is what's happening out there. We've got to recognise that we don't throw dollars and resources to stop cats killing our wildlife, then we are going to get air going to face by not fixing the problem. And the last thing, that, and I'll shut up after this, I'm concerned if there is a staged approach that we can maybe do a microchip and then some years later towards the end um, we'll review and maybe do a desexing. I would ask that we look at that data there and suggest that our ratepayers are sending a signal to us that they already are doing a lot of this, and we as a regularity authority are just catching up to what our ratepayers are doing. So be bold and go out there and get both cats D6 and microchip. That's eat me for the day. Thank you. And you will be at the table when this comes to Tas when the bylaw comes to Tasman District Council next, Mike, so you'll be able to I'll even bring the sleeping bag. Okay. Um, Peter, Peter, is up. You you did the uh, review of the various councils that have introduced bylaw and RPMP requirements relating to cats. Could you just give uh, Councillor just a, a, a quick um, overview in terms of similar size, similar sort of geographic area councils and what their approach has been, please? Yes, yeah, sure. So in terms of uh, chipping and um, de-sexing, the a lot of district councils and city councils around the country have done a, a mixed approach. Um, Selwyn District was one of the first in the South Island to go down that path. Um, I think they went down the microchipping path only. Um, there was a flurry of activity uh, a couple of years ago, like Whangarei District, 
uh, New Plymouth District um, have been had introduced similar bylaws all at the same time, and some of those were omitted. Some of them went for the, the desexing chipping approach. Um, the councillor, you mentioned Greater Wellington. They are a little bit different. Um, so separate from Wellington City, obviously, Wellington City have been leading the charge on the on that uh, microchipping nationally, um, and a lot of councils have followed followed their, their followed suit with them. Greater Wellington have a um, quite a uh, well, they've got a large regional park network and an established um, key native ecosystem program. So they do a lot of feral cat control. Uh, well, relatively, they do a lot of feral cat control because they've got a lot of regional park land and that K and E program that's been around for a long time and they're probably well resourced to do it. So they're the only council that I know of a regional council that do um, a reasonably uh, wide scale cat control, but it's also rats, possums, you name it, they, they do it through that program. So there's um, in terms of the district councils doing the bylaw work, I don't there set doesn't seem to be much action lately. Uh, whether that was around the, the recent um, elections, I don't know. Um, but yeah, there was a flurry of activity a couple of years ago, and certainly you guys, um, Tasman and Nelson, are at the kind of the forefront of what the next iteration of of where councils go. Thank you very much for that. I said I think Lower Hut were that they. Um, just at the end of last year, or middle of this year, they were they were going to do mock shipping and desexing, and that was to help um, biodiversity around Wainuiomata and Amata, and I think the coastline. Matt, the Tony. Thank you. Well, um, I think I will put the motion, which is what we've got up here, on the screen, and it's been moved and seconded. So all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Just a question about process. Were we in question time previously and now we're moving, we're going to debate or was it question and debate previously? Well, Tasman Council doesn't generally follow. We're not quite as organised as that, I'm sorry. But um, Aaron, have you got some more input that you'd like to have? No. Right, yes. No. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, all those, in, all those on the um, Joint Committee in favour of this say, um, who are, are in favour, say aye. I against carries unanimous. Thank you, everybody. Um, the, for the regional pest management plan that he has um, been, which has been part of his life for. How many years? Too many. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I hope you can feel you're leaving it in good hands. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I could, I could wax lyrical here, but I, I won't go on terribly. But I always like to think you try and leave something better than you found it. Um, and that's true of our uh, biodiversity and biosecurity. Tasman has now landed its... Um, um, biodiversity strategy. I think its regional pest management strategy is a good one and we're um, adding good stuff to it. So th thank you. I think I can lie straight in bed at night. <laughs> yes. D does this mean that you'll be able to um, submit on the TDC <laughs> cat by law? Yes, it probably does mean that I can do that. I've through my sort of working life, I've tried not to wind up in that situation where I've submitted against an employer. Uh, but um, I, I guess it does open that possibility. <laughs> it would just be seen, seen as positive advocacy, surely. But thanks for everything you've done. Yeah, thank you so much. So we we'll see you at public forum.
I also think that, you know, ex-council staff should be statutorily barred from standing for councils. <laughs> Yeah, but I was in a different region, though. <laughs> well, with that, thank you. Yeah, I'll ask um, Gwani to close with a karakia. Uh, kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa ponamu te moana, aroha atu, aroha mai, tēnā tātou, tēnā tātou, tēnā tātou, kā Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, Peter. Peter.